Hi, it's Arjun. So in this week's video, I want to bring together all the themes that I've been discussing since I started Super Spiked and really talk about how the themes interplay both sort of with and against one another to create what are going to be de facto virtuous or vicious cycles, both uh, in part from your perspective, but also depending on how these themes play out. So I've talked about returns on capital super cycle, super vol macro backdrop, ESG, both good and bad, uh, geopolitics, public policy, and all these different themes uh, relate to one another and they reinforce or counteract some of the trends that you're going to see and they all impact how I think companies ultimately should think about navigating this super vol energy crisis type macro environment. But let me go uh, right to the video and I'll see you at the end. So let me go through some of the key super spike themes. And I really want to talk in today's video about how they interplay with one another and how the interaction of these themes can lead to both virtuous and vicious cycles to some degree based on your perspective, uh, but ba also based on how these trends play out. So uh, I think everybody knows I believe in the super vol commodity backdrop. I believe in that more than just the pure traditional super cycle language. I think that connotes a sort of um, smooth bullishness that I do not believe in, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment, but I, I think many of you know that view. I believe we're in the early days of an ROCE super cycle. These tend to be 10 to 15 years up, 10 to 15 years down. We're coming off a 2006 to 2020 uh, down cycle, and I think we're in year one and a half of what should be at least a decade long ROC up super cycle. Geopolitics have always been part of energy. Um, I, I think in an environment where you are tight on spare capacity and supply, and where there's lots of disincentives, both from traditional and ESG and policy types from investing in traditional supply, you're going to compound that geopolitical issue. And we also have the growing risk of bad public policy. Uh, I, I suppose there's risk that public policy could actually do good things, but it feels, seems like we're more on track for 1970s style, really unfortunate public policy choices, which really helps nobody. Uh, there is this distinction on ESG between good ESG that I think is needed, the substantive part, versus what I call bad ESG, the virtue signaling, anti-fossil fuel, uh, climate-only ideology. But that is going to be a theme going forward and differentiating between, oh, I'm just going to again call it needed ESG versus the virtue signaling part that we could do without. It's going to impact all these themes and issues. And then finally, from a corporate strategy standpoint, how do you navigate this? How do you navigate a super vol environment, but where you probably have some profitability tailwinds, if you will, but you've got a lot of cross currents in terms of the geopolitics, the public policy risks, uh, the ESG both needs and that which you're trying to avoid. Uh, and I think there are a lot of challenges there for traditional energy companies. And again, the point of this video is to discuss the interplay between these themes that I think can drive both virtuous or vicious cycles. So to some degree, virtuous or vicious depends on your perspective, uh, but I think it also depends on how these themes play out. So let me, I want, I want to go through some of these key themes and then talk about how the other themes impact them is, is what the uh, attempt is here today. So super vol macro environment, what, what, why do I go with that and how do these other issues impact it? Um, there's currently insufficient CapEx going into what is still 80% of our energy mix, crude oil, natural gas, and coal. And it's for a variety of reasons. While I think the policy in ESG virtue signaling, the bad ESG gets a lot of attention. Quite frankly, we're coming off, as I mentioned, a pretty bad decade to 15 year stretch where traditional investors are saying, don't waste my money this time. Now, that message, I think, is more important to be delivered five years down the road when CapEx increases, not at you know the trough of the cycle when we actually need new CapEx. But regardless, that is the message. These companies uh, are receiving. They have not yet earned the right to spend money. Uh, maybe they're starting to, but that previous ROCE down cycle, I, to me, this is the overwhelming reason for why the CapEx response has been slow. But how do other themes play into it? To the extent we currently have the situation with Russia, Ukraine, for sure, if investors are skeptical about um, the, you know, the return on capital viability of these companies, when you throw in a Russia-Ukraine war, they're going to say, hey, 
some of this price stuff would go away if the tensions uh, ever, ever calm down. We do have the virtue signaling part where people are saying there's going to be an energy transition. Don't spend any more on fossil fuels. Uh, the companies people are able to yell at happen to be in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Uh, they, of course, are responsible for U.S., Canadian, and European supply. They do have some global businesses. But that virtue signaling ESG element, which combines with public policy that seeks to limit traditional supply, again, for some reason, only in the areas that uh, you know uh, these companies operate, which are, are areas like U.S., Canada, and Europe. But all these issues of ESG virtue signaling, public policy, and frankly, traditional investor concerns – and the ROC down cycle we had, it's all contributing to the super vol macro environment. And the point of super vol is that if you do not have CapEx, if you do not have sufficient supply, you have to keep bumping up against demand destruction pricing. And so when you have one barrel of too much demand, the price goes to whatever it needs to go to. It was the equivalent of $5 a gallon gasoline this past spring or early summer. But then when you take off the demand, the prices can collapse. And so that environment of continuously budding up against demand destruction pricing, but then coming off potentially quite hard, it's absolutely possible that we have local or global recession that causes pretty severe downturns to commodity prices, even as inventories and spare capacity are pretty low because, because we don't have capex for all these reasons. And again, it's the main reason, somewhat counterintuitively, why I don't like that traditional super cycle language, and I prefer the super vol macro type perspective. I, I hope that makes sense. It's a really critical point. So let me now turn to return on capital employed, which, of course, is always one of my favorite topics. CapEx and volatility are inversely correlated full stop. So if we're in a super vol macro backdrop, it is not the type of environment where either companies, management's boards, or investors are going to be excited about cranking up CapEx because if there is a concern that whatever price we have it is, un is unsustainable, and if we might actually see periods where prices do fall precipitously, even if it's only for a short period of time, all of that is going to cause there to be less CapEx than there otherwise would be. So super vol framework impacts uh, the willingness to spend CapEx even if returns on capital are otherwise uh, on the stronger side of things. Geopolitics, virtue signaling, ESG, bad public policy, all items that, again, uh, negatively impact the willingness to spend on CapEx, even at a time return on capital employed uh, is currently good. So typically, good returns mean there's a willingness to spend. Uh, that is not the case when either you're being told don't spend or B, I will never invest in you again because you're a fossil fuels company or public policy is against you or the geopolitics causes concerns about the sustainability of the environment. And so to some degree, the insufficient CapEx bodes well for duration of this ROCE super up cycle. I, 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 on a purity grounds, I, I, don't, I hate to stick the word up in there, but, but that is what we're talking about, uh, super up cycle duration. But it bodes poorly for the smoothness of it. Again, if we're going to be super vol, if we're going to bump up against demand destruction pricing, you're going to come off hard from time to time. I can't predict exactly when, but from time to time. And so our overall ROCE over the coming decade, I think is going to average a pretty good number for both the sector and the best in class companies. But it is not going to be smooth. Uh, and the lack of smoothness is going to hinder the willingness, the ability, the desire for companies to spend and for investors to support that spending. So let's talk a little bit about energy transition and how this is impacted by all these themes. So we've got a super vol macro backdrop. We've got the virtue signaling ESG. We've got concern about the pace of transition, all of which is muting the traditional uh, CapEx response in addition to, and I should have added it here, that legacy of poor returns last decade is, is actually probably the number one reason. As a result, we're having insufficient energy from good places. And I am giving you an American's perspective here. I am placing a personal judgment that energy from the United States, from Canada, and even Europe is good. And energy from, with apologies, 
places like Russia, certain countries in the Middle East, is bad. We should want more good energy and less bad energy. Without enough natural gas or nuclear, as we can see in Europe at this moment, we're going to use more coal. How is that good for energy transition? Hey, wh wh what is the logic in that? You have to provide energy for people. You don't always get to pick and choose. And when you choose to not have natural gas or nuclear, you end up with coal. How is that good for energy transition? And there's no doubt, to the extent we're going to butt up against demand destruction pricing, super volatile environment, you're going to have recessions from time to time, a less wealthy world will simply not be buying as many electric vehicles as some people would like. You're not going to be paying CO2 taxes. You're not going to be remaking electric grids. All these things that are needed to have more energy with ideally less environmental and climate footprint to do all of that. It is not happening in a recessionary, uh, less wealthy type world. So final theme I want to talk about here is ESG. Um, I, there's going to be a temptation to weaken environmental standards. I'm going to focus on the E here in ESG. Uh, and, and I'll probably save it for a separate topic. We have these um, growing number of, let's just call them anti-woke uh, ESG funds, kind of the anti-ESG element. They, let me just say, there are things, there is needed pushback on the virtue signaling part of ESG, no doubt about it. The anti-fossil fuel, climate-only ideologies, let's push back on that. I, I don't know that the answer is the anti-woke uh, funds that we're starting to see out there, but, but, but I'll get into that in a, in a, probably in a separate video. We could use permitting reform. We should want pipelines out of Appalachia. We should want pipelines from Canada to the United States with some of that crude oil being exported to the rest of the world and within Canada, maybe out west through, I think they call it TMX. Uh, let's get pipelines permitted and reform or, 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 or frankly, push back on environmental obstructionism uh, is needed. On the other hand, and I've said it before, it's not about gutting our, our environmental standards. I, I don't think there's really any good excuse for flaring anymore. And I'll, I'll keep coming back to that one. Maybe it's getting tired. But if you're building new crude oil capacity out of the Permian, let's ensure that you can have the permits and the plans, both, and the CapEx allocated to have the natural gas takeaway and processing capacity to ensure we don't have the excuse to start flaring because temporarily there's some huge spike in oil prices. So how do we reform permitting? How do we reform environmental review, review to expedite infrastructure growth without gutting? It's not about gutting all environmental regulations. So let's talk about corporate strategy. Uh, this is going to be the final slide. Ultimately, can you zig when others are zagging? If we are in a super vol macro backdrop where we occasionally, if not regularly, are going to butt up against demand destruction pricing super high, but then come crashing down to recession, local or global, into much lower prices, how do you manage that as a company? And can you kind of go counter to the trend, which is very hard to do? Can you invest when industry capital intensity is low? So right now, there is not a lot of CapEx going on. And as someone who's always wanted these companies to return more cash to shareholders, to focus on returns on capital, I am ecstatic about that decision. But it, it doesn't also mean that we want zero CapEx. It, it's not about just spending at maintenance levels. Who has advantage projects that are worthy of investment? Who can uh, perhaps invest in advantage projects when industry capital intensity is otherwise low, rather than, rather than waiting till everyone's spending, the good days are back, quote unquote, and capital intensity and CapEx is high, like we saw in the 2011 to 2014 timeframe last super cycle. It was a terrible time to invest. Uh, you wanted to invest early in the cycle. You know, companies are good about divesting and hunkering down at the trough. H how about doing that at the peak? How about taking those free cash flows and putting it on the balance sheet so that you can spend when we have our inevitable down, down, down cycle, maybe hunker down at the peak isn't the exact right phraseology. But again, the idea is spend less at the peak, spend more at the trough. It is a very, very hard thing to do. I appreciate it. But these are the kind of goals we're trying to, uh, trying to get at. We all know, and this is probably geared more for the upstream companies, M&A is an inevitability. 
every company, the reserves have a certain asset life to them. And once they're depleted, that's it. For the top quartile of companies, the top quartile that deserve to be going concerns, that have double digit, if not higher, you know, mid-teens or higher, I should say, returns on cap employed, fortress balance sheet, they have good substantive ESG, M&A is not only inevitable, it should be done. How do you do it countercyclically? Um, right now, we're at a time where prices have come up a lot, but we're still in a low spending environment. I suspect if we do have recession in the coming year plus, there's going to be opportunity. Do you have the kind of balance sheet? Do you have a fortress balance sheet to take advantage of these things? We know M&A is inevitable. I get that when you look at the sector broadly, investors are concerned about wasting money and making bad deals. And that may be true at the broad sector level. It, I don't think it's true for the top quartile companies, which is always my focus. So I'll end this video on a personal note. I know I've been somewhat critical or skeptical of European energy and climate policy, but I wanna say something positive after having spent eight days in Scotland. We drove uh, almost 600 miles from Edinburgh to Inverness, a day trip to Loch Ness, a day trip to Nairn, then to St. Andrews, around in Crail, around in Leithen, back to Edinburgh, I think it was 571 miles based on the Google Maps calculator. And I reset the trip odometer. I averaged, we averaged 59 miles per gallon. And so as someone who's a big proponent that fuel economy is one of the big missed opportunities to lessen the world's dependence on oil demand for a given level of economic growth, I got to say plus one to Europe for getting at least that right. We were in a what they're calling an intermediate SUV. It was a Toyota CHR. I mean, it, it's a minuscule of a car, but by, by European standards, it was an intermediate SUV somehow, not a small SUV. 59 miles per gallon. Kudos to Europe for at least getting one thing right, uh, and that is the fuel economy piece. And I have to say, I'll see if I can post a video. I don't think the sound quality was too good that in Leven, the wind was blowing. So there was, on the day we were there, it was a great round at Dumbarney Links, highly recommended. It's a newer course uh, that just opened in Fife uh, about three years ago in Leven, in the kingdom of Fife. Dumbarney Links, a great shot of that same wind farm offshore Leven, the town of Leven, and it was blowing. Again, a couple pluses for European policy uh, as someone who's otherwise been pretty critical. Take care. Here we are, back at Leven. This is the Dumbarney Links golf course, and you can see the same wind turbines we saw a few months ago, and they are moving. They're moving actually at a decent pace. It's moderately windy today, so okay, good news on the internet today. Let's see our oil rig. Well, lo and behold, a super spike subscriber is actually the CEO who owns that rig. It is technically coal stacked. So really good news that the wind turbines are moving today. Let's just take a look at this beautiful golf course. It's, it only opened about three years ago. Just awesome wind course here. In 